Okay, good morning, everybody. Today's Wednesday, January 20th, 2021. And so I'm doing this episode a little bit later than I would have liked to just because I wanted to very quickly watch Trump's departure just to see if there would be anything that he would say or do that would um, be worthy of reporting to you guys today. Now, all over the world, literally the Middle Eastern, European, all all over the world, African, all the news is surrounding the inauguration today pretty much of Joe Biden. But there are a few things that I've been able to pick out to kind of, uh, you know, give everybody a bit of a break from that. But let's get into it anyways. Let's just get over with the main stuff. So Mitch McConnell blasted Trump yesterday in a statement saying that he incited the violence and this and that. And look, if we take a purely objective perspective of this, the guy is a master strategist and politician in a lot of ways. He's made a lot of mistakes. But again, from a purely non, um, oh, sorry, a purely non-ethical, uh, moral, non-moral point of view, he's playing it smart in pure theory. But again, that's taking all morals and ethics out of it. So again, it's not for me to decide what his, what that statement meant, what it was supposed to mean, if it was trying to purge Trump of the Republican Party permanently or for other things as well. So we'll see. Now, the other thing is that the rumor is, as of now, that McConnell told Trump not to pardon Trump, uh, sorry, not to pardon uh, Assange or Edward Snowden. And the reason for that was because apparently McConnell told Trump that if you really want to get the neocons, the establishment, the swamp on your back after your presidency and you pardon these guys, you're asking for it. And so, again, it... it, the thing about pardoning Assange and Snowden is that it's going to upset the establishment and the neocons. Now, the neocons are the are the Mitch McConnells, the Nancy Pelosi's of the world, the Chuck Schumer's, the ones that have been there for years and years and years, have super strong connections to corporations, constantly win over and over again their um, their state elections to keep their position, are making millions and millions on the back end. Those are the neocons. Those are the ones that are, you know, nothing ever changes. Same thing over and over. They've been there for 20, 30, 40 years. Those are the ones that are going to go after Trump. And I believe it. Whether or not you like Trump, it's true. They're going to go after him. And especially if he pardoned Snowden and Assange, they would have the, I, I hate to use the term, but let's just say the deep state, so to speak, and the establishment would have fought so goddamn hard to somehow reverse those pardons or give some type of exception. But again, very interesting to see what would have happened if that was the case. Because imagine if Trump had pardoned them and they came back to the U.S. to live out their lives and then the U.S. somehow reversed that pardon or completely vo- voided that pardon and made it null and have no meaning, they'd be able to arrest them on home uh, U.S. soil. But I guess, it, again, it depends. It depends which route they wanted to take, if they wanted to even take any type of strategic route with that at all, right? The next thing is that two National Guard members were removed from security patrol for their alleged far-right views. Now, there's conflicting reports about this, and there was two National Guard members that were being removed from the Capitol uh, because apparently they held far-right views. Allegedly, some are claiming there's no evidence of this. Others are claiming there is. Others are just saying, oh, well, they're white men. Like, that's what I actually read in an article and what I've been seeing on YouTube. Now, again, not saying that's from a substantiated source at all, but again, when so many things are scattered all over the place, it's not best for you or I to make a judgment call on it. We just have to see how it plays out, which is kind of ironic because, like I said yesterday, I think it's interesting to see that the news is always about playing out over and over and over again, which is why I believe we can do this episode in less than 25 minutes to cover the news for the day because, again, the mainstream media, they just drag it on and on and on, right? The next thing is that Trump pardoned a bunch of people and uh, commutated as well, a bunch of people, including Lil Wayne, Steve Bannon, a uh, bunch of uh, Kodak Black, the rapper as well, you name it. Now, I mean, hey, th- it's not been unusual for a president to issue hundreds of pardons or commutations on their final day in office or their last week or what have you. So, look, if you wanted to pardon them, I mean, people have argued, while well, the mainstream media has argued, these are not the type of people you'd want to pardon. But what they're not mentioning is that he also pardoned a bunch of nonviolent offenders and things that fell in line with his agenda and belief system as well. Of course, there were controversial pardons like Jared Kushner's father, but that was a while ago. That wasn't part of, I think, last night's pardon list. But uh, one thing he did not do was, I, if I'm not mistaken, he did not pardon Giuliani. He did not pardon himself nor his kids. But again, if you pardon the people around the investigations of your kids, automatically what happens is that court case or that legal case will kind of just simmer away. So it's a bit of a smart play. Again, depends on your perspective, but you know, 
you, you guys know what I was going to I'm going to say it's up it's up to you guys. The next thing is that Biden is allegedly going to sign 17 executive orders on day 1 reversing a lot of Trump's rules and regulations and restoring Obama era ones. Well, here's the thing. A lot of people have said that the choices between Trump and Biden were not great, especially people who didn't like either of them. And the thing is is that a lot of people said, well, if Biden's just going to be like an extension of Obama, then it's just going to be more Obama era things. And we're noticing here a lot of people Biden's been appointing have been Obama era and Obama administration officials, which look, I would say give them a chance because I'm a very optimistic person, maybe a little bit more than I should be. But we've seen eight years of some of these people that Biden's bringing in again. So at this point, like, what's the difference? All this hope for change and things like this, man, it, they better f come through with the promises they made. If not, then this is the true, true test ultimately to show that politics is, is just a bunch of nothing burgers, all talk and no action, right? And I know that's something s Trump said constantly in the 2016 campaign, but it's true, right? I mean, a lot of people thought that with Obama being sworn in, there was more hope for change and things like that. And, you know, according to some people, things changed. According to others, it stayed the same. Obama told the line. According to some others, things got worse. But the thing is, too, is that Obama himself admitted that what he had promised to do in the first four years was not even close to what he accomplished realistically. So again, the next thing is that far left activists are calling for secret police to monitor Trump supporters. Look, this is a controversial topic because you have I think with anything in life, you have different extremist groups in many different ways. And I'm not saying the Trump people are extremist groups. But what I'm saying here is that you have a lot of people that think extremely within groups that are moderate. And I'm not talking about the mega group. I'm just saying in general, we cannot look at Trump supporters and Trump people as people that are mentally sick or something like this, because that is how you create more of an anger coming out of them. We have to sit down with them and say, okay, where can we find similarities within the differences? Because clearly we're not going to find any similarities between us and, you know, the far left and things like this. So it's either these groups stand down on both the far right and the far left, or it's just going to keep going on like this. Now, again, that also leans into the argument that if they keep being banned off social media, it's only going to drive them into darker and darker corners of the Internet, so to speak, and have more extremist thoughts, if you will, because they'll feel angered by the system and disenfranchised. And that's a very relatable perspective. And that's the thing. Biden never really said how he was going to unite the country because he can't. I mean, let's be realistic. He can't. What happens is, is the perception of the mind changes. So if people who like Biden say, yeah, I can feel it after, you know, six months, the country's changing. No, it's changing in your head. And I would say that about the opposite thing as well. Unless you really see a dramatic difference, like bridges are being put up, laws are, you know, taxes are being dropped or, or things like that. Corporations stop giving money to politicians. Unless you see those kind of changes, then what's all these promises are empty promises, right? So. Again, trying to just play neutral here. Now, the next thing is that the Iranian president said he's very happy that Trump is gone. I mean, look, they didn't like him because he was unpredictable. He also didn't like Iran. And he also signed that Israel Middle East deal um, with uh, the UAE, the United Arab Emirates. And apparently, which brings me to my next point, one of Biden's staffers, a source had told or one of his aides had told the press that Biden's not going to uh, reverse or go back on the Middle East deal. No, because unless I'm missing some significant part of it, from my understanding at least, the Middle East deal was a good deal. And I say that not because it's Trump. Anything, Democrat or Republican, anything that focuses more towards peace without any type of like, you know, secret catch or like, you know, some type of hidden favor is fantastic. Now, I'm not saying we I know everything about this Middle East deal. Not even close. I'm sure some of you guys may actually know more about it than I do. But ultimately... We have to look at how it is viewed from an external perspective because that's it's sad, but that's what counts. It's true. That's what counts. And when we look at that, what we'll see is that everything's much more peaceful in a lot of ways. Now, there's still a lot of problems, still a lot of violence. But again, it's all contextual and it's all about it's all about progress. Right. And one could argue, well, Dave, you know, those arguments you're making don't make any sense with what you just said for your last few points. But again, I an my answer to that is it's contextual. It's all about context. Right. The next thing is that China's Jack Ma finally made an appearance for the first time since it's been reported that he was missing after criticizing the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. Excuse me. I knew in my gut the guy wasn't killed. Probably had to go into hiding because he pissed off a lot of people. Um, but you know what? I don't want to say when you have that much money, you're untouchable because when it comes to China, 
I don't think they care how much money one has. If the CCP wants something done, it'll get done. Maybe there's a bigger objective here with him staying staying alive or something like this. And I'm not saying I wish for him to be dead, not at all. I don't wish for anyone to die. But, I mean, again, it's very iffy to see if there's some type of play going on here or if he knows it's only a matter of time before he gets kidnapped or something like this. His private security detail gets infiltrated or what have you, right? So you don't get to that point without making close friends and close dangerous enemies as well that are never far from you, right? And that's just kind of the business that you sign up for when you get to the point of saying, do I want to cross that threshold of, you know, being involved with the government and these type of classified things, right? The next thing is that the U.S. Embassy will r remain in Jerusalem. And again, this has to do with what I was discussing as it pertains to the Middle East deal with Israel and UAE. Great. I mean, look, it should stay there. I mean, in a lot of ways, and maybe, look, that's me being biased. I am a fan, I have to tell you, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I am a fan of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Um, I know he's made a lot of mistakes, and nobody's perfect. I am a fan of him. I do like what he's saying with respects to, you know, Israel is geographically surrounded by its enemies, so it needs to have sharp, sharp intelligence, sharp, sharp military, and all that stuff. And with regards to Israel attacking, you know, e uh, Egypt and, you know, all these other places, the Gaza Strip, all that, I, I ran, it, let them, and, and I'm not trying to encourage violence, but let them handle their own issues, if, if that makes sense, right? The next thing is that the UK border system has allegedly hit its limit due to the Brexit deal, which caused it to collapse even more. And I say to that, I mean, look, they signed up for Brexit, so they're going to have to face the great things that come with it and also the bad things that come with it. Now, some argue there are no good things that come with it, and that's a very valid argument to be made, but it's not for me to decide what is right, what is wrong. I'm just here to report to you that apparently the UK border has hit its limits since the Brexit deal. So they got to revamp something. They got to come up with something that I guess would be a rule similar to the European Union um, or something that would be a little bit more correlated to some type of favorable trading but the whole point is well if you want to get if you want to get to that point come back to the eu and then that's where ego comes in human ego is one of the worst things because pride ego all of that it gets in the way and then when it gets in the way everybody goes oh well i'm not dealing with you because this this, and this and then nothing happens everything stalls it's it's a disaster it's a disaster the next thing is that fedex is cutting 6300 employees in europe Look, these are still rough times. I mean, even though the mainstream media is not talking about it, it's very interesting to see that, you know, even though the mainstream media doesn't talk about it, people still keep COVID in their minds because it's affecting their immediate daily lives. And that's the only time people will notice and call for real change. But when we look at these 6,300 employees being laid off, that's quite the number. That's a substantial number to any country's economy and even to any country's, you know, economic uh, financial system back home where the headquarters is. So... It's interesting to see. It's interesting to see. It's very sad, obviously, for the people that have lost their jobs. And uh, But this is not the first time we've seen this. You know, airline industry, all that because of COVID, meatpacking plants, you name it, right? So the next thing is that Parler moved to a Russian hosting service because nobody else would host them. Fuck, I mean, I, it works perfectly for the for the Democrats' narrative of the Russians, the Russians, the Russians. I'm not going to lie. It does work perfectly. But... Ironically enough, we also have to be vigilant, and I'm not saying that Russia's, you know, got a secret plan here, but we have to be vigilant from an intelligence standpoint, not a political one. And the intelligence standpoint is that if these Russian servers are hosting Parler, this may give Russia more and more access to this type of data, which they know American conservatives like to go on. We have to be vigilant, guys. I'm not saying Russia is doing that. I'm just saying we got to look at all the options. But also, I have to give shit to the left as well for pushing a half-assed false Russian narrative for years, right? And both sides have agreed on that too. The next thing is that um, the Swiss have opened a money laundering probe into Lebanon's central bank. Ironic. So ironic. Because the Swiss are known for being able to hold money that the U.S. cannot touch, if I'm not mistaken. I believe that's one of the countries. that They're in the, uh, the Mediterranean where it's, you can't, uh, the U.S. can't touch that money or can't get access to it. I mean, ironic that the, you know, the, the pot is calling the kettle black, but you, you know what I mean, right? It's could be to divert attention, could be a legitimate investigation. You don't think these central banks count on, on cartel money and stuff? Of course they do. When the American economy collapsed in 2008, the, one of the, it was argued by economists that one of the things that kept the economy 
sort of state well alive rather not stable alive was the the drug money from uh, from cocaine and things like that and cash more cash circulated in 2008 than ever before if i'm not mistaken in american history and so okay maybe the great depression but that's a bit of a different story but you see that clearly this illegal form of of money this illicit form of money i mean gee, like christ it, it's a, it's a it's a crucial part of any world economy if any of this drug money was removed from these laundered accounts you know how much that would affect things and again the whole point is yeah well we shouldn't let them launder money okay so stop the war on drugs and then we'll talk then <laughs> that would be that would be my answer to that um because you got to deal with the demand of the drug first before you uh take out the supply and before you start going after the finances because again it'll just keep going and going and going like anything in life you know one drug dealer gets arrested another drug dealer replaces him same thing in corporate uh, in corporate business one ceo steps down another one replaces him they generally have the same agendas so you know the next thing is that or the final thing is that the trump administration has said that china's been committing genocide with those i think i'm going to mispronounce this but those uyghur camps and we knew that for a while even the the regular afternoon episodes that i do i've covered this as well so again people were laughing at this a handful of years ago just like the thing with the epstein island people laughed at it until it turned out to be true then you realize that not everything we talk about on this show and other shows as well similar to this are not that insane right so again we also have to look at the fact that the trump administration might be saying this just to stir the pot to to dampen the relations with biden and china but it's hard to say considering china uh, biden's previous connections to china as well so unless there's news that has occurred while i'm recording this as of right now in the moment that's it for today and uh, thank you guys so much again we will catch you tomorrow have a good hump day or wednesday whatever cheers <laughs>